Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next episode of the Thoughtful Solutions Podcast. I'm your host, Matt. And I'm your co-host, Chris. And today's going to be another cool episode. We're going to be discussing public health and what it means. That's going to be a pretty insightful discussion here. Public health is definitely something that is looked at today, but not to the degree that it should as a metric for how well a society is doing. And it is going to be a really fun and exciting topic. And just as a preview for next week as well, the next episode is going to be on food water, and energy potentials, which will also be a very fun episode as well. But yeah, just to start off, how you doing, Chris? I'm doing good, man. How are you? Man, it's been a been a crazy week. Just found out that the wife is pregnant, so that's going to be I exciting. Know. Oh, man. I know. Oh, my God. It's a... Uh, it's going to be hell of the next few months for sure. It'll be an exciting time. I know. I still haven't, I haven't told any of my people yet, but, but, oh my God, I do. I'm so stoked for you. Yeah, uh, man. Shh. It's a secret until next week. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, to kickstart today's discussion, so as an introduction for public health, obviously it's implied in the name. It's a metric of how healthy a society is and how really the the population is doing not just in terms of individual health but in terms of other broader metrics for when you look at a society but a little statement that i think would be pretty pretty relevant to this discussion is that why would you care about society if society doesn't care about you and yeah. On an individual level, public health is a way that society as a larger like order framework can help display this. In modern kind of senses, there are a lot of industrialized nations and obviously third world and developing countries that have very low public health metrics, high infant mortality, low life expectancy, the prevalence of chronic diseases, the amount of violence that takes place in the society, all kinds of different metrics. There are definitely some examples of countries to look at in the world that do have relatively high public health metrics, but uh, we're going to be getting into all that here soon. So in order to relate it to our discussion of socioeconomics and system science and, and the viable system, I'm going to mention this at the beginning here, but we'll touch on it as we come towards the end of this episode. Public health needs to be looked at as a feedback mechanism. It is a metric of how successful a society is dealing with its its populace and how people are treated, again, on that individual level and as a larger group order units. And unfortunately, in today's current paradigm, we don't see that being as much of the case. Yes, public health is looked at to a certain degree. There are obviously very smart public health experts that are very well versed in the topic, but it's not a main referent point that determines how free market capitalism operates as a socioeconomic system. And we're going to be here advocating that it is something that is one of the most important metrics that you can look at when it comes to having it be a main feedback mechanism and how you actually design a viable human socioeconomic system. So we've divided this up into a few different points that we're going to touch on. The first one is going to be talking about something that we as all humans deal with, and that is food. Not only food quality, but also access to food and the concept of food deserts and monoculture agricultural practices. So anybody who has grown up in a lower socioeconomic class, like me and Chris have, you have definitely come across times where food has been 
more scarce than at other times uh, in your existence. And when that food becomes scarce, the quality of the food you have access to decreases. You have your cheap foods, your, your chips, your soda, your highly processed foods, fast food, all the stuff that is not very, you know, clearly healthy for an individual to consume for long periods of time. So when considering something like food quality, it really is a underlying factor for other health problems that might develop uh, down the line. Yeah, so like food quality, what, what, what do you look at in a quality food? So for me personally, when it comes to food quality, it's a, a always just kind of like a harder to obtain type of thing to talk about. Because if I'm thinking about good quality food, you know, the more expensive, fresher, freshly made, or, or you know, actual grown real food, those things are, are somewhat like a scale above what I'm usually eating every day, or a couple of scales above what I'm usually eating every day, you know, lower food quality, that uh, gas station food. Uh, uh, just ate Burger King for lunch today, actually. So, yeah. And and it's also, you know, I was going to mention when you brought up the food desert concept that kind of goes along with our, our shitty food quality. Like, I don't know if people exactly get what we're trying to say when we, when we say food desert. It's not like, you know, a, a place where there is no food whatsoever. It could also just be an area where, like, there is plenty of food, but it's all crappy. There's no access to good uh, uh fresh food that could also be like a food desert but um yeah it's, yeah when it's, it comes to it's very much okay. food that has essentially been like locked behind a paywall you know if if you come from a rural community that might have a large agricultural sector that a lot of people are employed employed in yeah you're gonna have access to farm fresh foods and or if you as an individual have like a garden or you have like access to local farmers markets things where you can easily obtain fresh quality food you know fresh meats vegetables mm. fruits all that good stuff animal products whatever it is that oh, yeah. is and of course if people could grow more of their own actual food as well i mean yeah no one talks about that but you know at having direct access by actually growing food in your own land or your own backyard could start to help the freaking uh, long-term chronic diseases from the shitty food quality we're used to. Yeah, and that also unfortunately does have its own economic paywall and a degree locked behind it as well. You know, not everyone's going to have the amount of space or right or access to supplies. Yeah, or the time and money per se in the current paradigm to to go down that route but that that very much is what we mean by food quality it's it's the stuff that is not cheap highly processed packaged available at something that is again like a convenience store gas station fast food just just th think of when, when you hear the term fresh that's that's more what we're belying here so it, it very much is locked into certain communities. Certain communities might have a very high abundance of access to high quality foods. This would not, not be considered a food desert. But if you live in a highly urbanized area, uh, like we come from a big city in Florida where those people who live in the downtown area are not gonna have as much access to fresh farm grown food. And if they do, it's at the grocery store for an obscenely high price compared to what you would get uh, otherwise. Mm -hmm. So, or sometimes not even. Like, uh, I had done work at the hospital downtown, and the only food around, the only food around, was a Walgreens. And I went to that Walgreens, empty shelves, and packed. There was so many people in there. It was the middle of downtown, next to the hospital. Just nothing else around to go to for these people. And empty shelves in there. Real food desert. Oh, exactly. And so the quality of the food, the access that somebody has to it, are very much, as I said, determinant on the location that this individual resides in. But 
we we really do want to harp on the point of of a food desert and as chris just exemplified there with his example the the things that these people are able to not only afford economically but also the locations that they have to go to to get access to food are very much determinant based off of their socioeconomic situation. Clearly, if you do live in like a downtown, highly urbanized area, but you have the money to have a vehicle, you can travel somewhere to get the food, which you can afford because you're of better means than those who might not have access to those types of food sources, you are very much the the exception to the people who are more adversely impacted by this reality. So food deserts definitely belie a lot of other public health issues. And as we uh, move a little bit forward and we start talking about chronic diseases, it'll definitely be a, uh, a factor in, in determining which populations might suffer from these types of illnesses. But as I had also mentioned when talking about this food subject, uh, you could look on the other side of the spectrum with an issue. This is more of a larger order systemic issue is something like monoculture agricultural practices. As we've seen throughout history with examples like the Irish potato famine, various wheat crop failures that have occurred throughout the entirety of freaking human existence. If If you grow too much of one thing and you deplete the soil quality and you don't rehab the earth that you're tilling over and over, you're going to create larger food system issues. And also, if you have a crop like here in America, definitely corn. You know, corn is a decent food staple in a mixed diet, but when it is so pervasive through the use of, of corn, you know, high fructose corn syrups and various corn syrups, and it is highly processed into uh, tortillas and tortilla chips and all that stuff and is is fried and packaged it has become such a cheap and readily available food stuff that it becomes the crutch for those who unfortunately are in these food deserts so because other types of crops are not being subsidized in the current paradigm and incentivized to create more of a varied type of crop yield it very much shows that, you know, while obviously it's better than just outright starving and dying, you're you're going to see consequences down the line for pushing certain crops as opposed to a more varied approach. And this definitely has a technological component to it as well. Definitely in the future, as we see agricultural science and a shift in food production mechanisms towards concepts like vertical farming, and as Chris had mentioned, more individualistic, self-sustaining gardening systems and community projects and stuff like that, you're going to see mm -hmm. these issues slowly become eliminated. But in the current paradigm where it is more economically viable to produce monoculture crops that are genetically engineered to be the most resilient, which isn't a bad issue, but if if that's all you're doing and all you're producing is this one crop, then you're going to see, again, issues with food quality and the types of uh, foods that are more readily available to, to the populace and those of lower means. So food's definitely a big one here, but again, having food quality, food access, and the concept of like food deserts and monoculture that is sort of the public health implication behind why it's an important metric. But we could definitely shift towards talking about sort of a, a different aspect of public health, which is the prison system, which mm. we here in America are very familiar with because it is quite per pervasive throughout our, our society. And we have such a large prison industrial complex that you see every facet of governmental and economic realities kind of coming to a head to produce the beast that is the American prison system. 
And clearly, if you have the U.S., I think, has like 3% of the world's population, but we have 25% of the world's prison population, that is another aspect of, of looking at public health in that kind of metric. You want to have an extremely low prison population to be an example of a society that is more healthy compared to others. So looking at a bloated prison system, I think the big thing you need to look at first is what is the economic incentives behind it. So you have the politicians and the large prison companies. A lot of the U.S. prisons are privately owned. So there's already that profit motive that me and Chris have talked about before that these you know, entities are trying to look to maximize. And they do that by filling beds. The more people that are in prisons, the more these companies are going to get money on their government contracts and whatnot, and that's how they increase the profitability of, of their prison systems. And obviously, with them being incentivized to fill these beds, they are looking towards influencing politicians, judges, lawmakers to really create a system that that maximizes that potential. So that's why you see things like minimum sentencing laws, nonviolent offenses, getting prison time, and having really high recidivism rates, which we do here in the United States, which is somebody's propensity to go back into the prison system after they're released. So you see this beast, Chris. What what kind of... I know that neither of us have gone to prison, but we do know people that have, or at least have gone to jail or something. But I, I know, I know you see the issues with with the structural incentive. But what well, what's kind of your personal exposure to how pervasive this this kind of system is? Well, there's there's a, a federal level prisons like the when you actually become a felon or break federal law. Is usually. Uh, there's more steps to it to getting to that, but state prisons and county prisons, county jails, um, all of these things that are state, those are the private ones. Those are where there's actually heavy, heavy incentive to keep money coming in. And it's more so than just than just beds also. They have basically free slave labor using these people, paying them, if they pay them at all. Oh, yeah. But um, work camps throughout the this all these states Dishing out, I guess, anything from license plate tags to some weird crop in the area, but you know, there's money going straight to the jails and prisons on these on these levels as well. It's all corrupt. It's all so corrupt, and the recidivism, like you had mentioned, there's harder harder penalties for your second and third. You know, if you end up going back, which is how you end up. And an even deeper and deeper hole in prison. Like, for instance, you know, if you did your bid and it was a year, but now you, you obviously you're a felon. Now you have these new rules that you have to live by. Set up very easy to break them. And also when you break them, it's set up to give you maximum penalty. That way now you're going for your full, you know, whatever the maximum was for the possible, you know, nonviolent crime that you did or like minor crime that you did. I mean, there's the, the once you've gone, it's pretty well known that once you've gone once, you're probably likely to go back. It's hard not to. It's hard for these people not to because of how how bad the system is once you get put in there. Yeah, and I think something else to consider is you look at countries that have a very punitive prison system, like we do here in the U.S., and you had just alluded to that with the system very much being set up to get people back into the system because it's hard to shift your life towards not being, oh, I was a felon. The opportunities you have coming out of that are going to be vastly different than somebody who hasn't been input into the prison system. Whereas other countries <laughs> that do have more rehabilitative prison systems yeah. are going to very much have a different mindset when it comes to trying to reorient these sort of people back into society. And 
just as a caveat, yeah. clearly, if you're some crazed, violent offender who's murdered people, yeah, no, that's that you you need to be segmented from society, but that that's not the majority. That is definitely the minority when it comes to the prison system. And again, with the United States, that's why there's such a bloat when it comes to the prison population is you have a lot of people who have gone to prison for petty theft, burglary, drug related offenses for sure, you know, all kinds of things, your white collar crimes when yeah. those should definitely be not prioritized compared to those who uh, are are violent offenders. Clearly that's what the system should be pushed towards is actually keeping those who are the biggest threat to society uh, segmented from the rest. But when it comes to even those individuals, but obviously those who are not that too far gone, it's about trying to get them back into the system and trying to contribute back to society. Because yeah, a lot of these people have just fallen on hard times. They might have had to do something out of desperation to either feed their family, keep themselves afloat, and you might just be one of the ones who had fallen on hard times and, and end up in those situations. And to see that propel you on a much different life path compared to other people who might have had different opportunities, it's it's very much a shame to see because a lot of these people are just looking to get by. And yeah. it's, you know, also you could look at the bloated, like, legal code that we have and all the laws and whatnot and that kind of feeds back into what we've discussed before when we talk about a viable system in ashby's law if if the system itself was able to take all these types of of mal occurrences into consideration you wouldn't need such a large legal code to the extent that we see today, because they would have been issues that would have already been solved by the system's design in its outset. So it's it's like all of these things are hobbled up after the fact to try and punitively tell you, no, you can't do this in the current system because the system is inadequate to provide your needs as an individual. And I would definitely stretch to say that a lot of, of your average crimes are of an economic mode. A lot of people are doing it for either money, food, or out of desperation, as I said. So if Yeah, you could have been very young too. There's so many youth offenders is what you are, but you know, people just eighteen to twenty four. I mean I consider that still very young. Scientifically your brain's not fully developed yet. So twenty five for men, twenty three for, for women, so shit. See how what like I wonder how much of the prison populace you could probably look this up is uh, uh just kids basically. Yeah, and it's it's a shame to see that reality come forth. And not only that, but look at what types of home situations that these people might have come from. Obviously, they tend to be from lower socioeconomic classes. And if you and your family situation were were grown up in in quite destitute conditions and especially in impoverished neighborhoods and communities, you're going to be more predisposed to these these kind of situations. So there's definitely a much larger socioeconomic component to to the prison right. system. But we we can definitely talk about the US as sort of that example on one end of the spectrum, but we could also look at something like uh, some of the Scandinavian countries as the kind of other side of the spectrum where they do have a more rehabilitative prison system so i believe they have a max prison sentence of 21 or 25 years or something like that and they very much focus on trying to reintegrate prisoners back into society by job training providing amenities and outlets during your your time that you're being sentenced to help create that sense of, oh, society maybe isn't trying to fuck me as as hard as I really feel that they have, and it, it definitely generates a different mindset, but you also are provided more counseling, psychiatric care if needed, and it's it's really, again, about trying to shift the focus from the 
incentives that a U.S. based system look at towards, hey, these are people that have really done bad things to a certain degree, but have also just fallen on hard times. It's better to get these people back into contributing to society. And you're going to see, again, much lower recidivism rates, which are exemplified in these countries as well. So again, your propensity to go back to prison is much lower in these types of, of European prison systems. And that, that's not to say that people won't go back. I mean, that's a reality that I don't think we're going to necessarily eliminate in its entirety. But because the system is designed from its outset to, again, be more rehabilitative, you, you see what that plays out. So you kind of have those two different spectrums on, or the two different ends of the spectrum when it comes to the prison system. And clearly one is a much better metric for public health. The other one is almost a malignant plague on that public health metric. So the prison system is something we can look at to, again, be another element in what we consider public health. Because a prison system is going to be something that society will probably need for quite a bit longer. But it's how we look at how that portion of the system is designed that is very important to consider. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I was just thinking, like, if public health in general is feedback or should be used as feedback for a viable system, and prison systems are a, a blatant sign of a good feedback of how a system is currently functioning, and look how bad it is. Fuck. Oh yeah, exactly. It's it's just again relevant to like food as well. It's just another thing to look at that tells you. Hey, if you are got a lot of prisons and these prisons are being filled up, something's wrong. <laughs> and it's about mm. diving deeper to see what really the issue is there. And another important thing to look at when talking about public health is chronic diseases. Diseases that are pervasive in their symptomatic causes compared to something that can be cured with antibiotics or some type of regimen or whatever. These are your illnesses like heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, cancer, things that really stick around for the long term. Yeah, you know, it's a time thing with the when it's chronic. The longer you got it, well, that's for the rest of your life sometimes. Yeah, and while some of these diseases, I mean, there are hundreds, if not thousands, that we could elaborate on, but there are the big ones that very much affect larger sums of the population, like you could take heart disease, for example, it's something that kills roughly like 600,000 Americans a year or some crap. It's, it's a very big killer when it comes to uh, the American populace. And that mm -hmm. also feeds back into what we talked about with the food system. A lot of these can, you know, while they, definitely have genetic components to it some of them do it really is based off of lifestyle choices how stressed the, you yeah, are food. yeah as, as you just said a big part of it. food big thing when talking about heart disease obviously you want to have foods that are high in nutrient density as compared to highly processed foods and high carb diets that very much stress out your uh, your pulmonary system and, and your, your heart and your cardiovascular system. There is, again, very much a dietary component when it comes to uh, the health of an individual's heart. And this also feeds back into the, to the food topic that we were talking about. If you are of a socioeconomic means, you are going to be more pre predisposed to these types of illnesses. It's one of the chronic diseases that definitely has a socioeconomic class relationship. It's very much a, a lower class disease. You can also apply that towards other chronic diseases. Another big one is, is as I said, diabetes. While there is type 1 diabetes, which has a strong genetic component, uh, it is another one that is heavily linked to diet and can see a lot of health issues down the line 
and is definitely a, a health factor when it comes to being influenced by other diseases. We're going through the COVID-19 pandemic and there is, you know, a pre-existing condition like diabetes can definitely worsen your body's ability to effectively fight off these kind of diseases, but it's also something that can be somewhat hard to manage. But if you as a lower uh, class individual don't have access to the foods and the types of things you need to manage this type of illness, along with also the knowledge and the access to medical personnel to help really deal with these, uh, you're going to see a lot of these things being exacerbated. And you can also look at the healthcare aspect feeding into this as well. The healthcare aspect of not having access to the types of preventative care, the counseling when it comes to nutrition or diagnostic medicine. I mean, you, you see it, Chris. I, I think we all do. If, if people were able to go to a doctor when they're not feeling well, which might be relative to some occurrence they're going through. Imagine all of the resources that would be saved as opposed to treating these people down the line when they need a freaking heart transplant, you know? Yeah, yeah. Over the insanely expensive medication that's going to get prescribed to you when you're older. Yeah, that's another thing, too. I mean, when you reach that certain point as well, you're going to need to be on some insanely... I mean, didn't you say that you had, like... A neighbor or My something neighbor. who was paying like 600 bucks or some crap for like heart medication? Exactly. It was for you know, heart failure is what he was dealing with. And two months of of pills, two months worth of pills was $600. So yeah, but 60 days, $600. And that's, you know, stuff that he's going to be on as long as he can keep on living. Yeah, yeah that's... Heart disease. Definitely an example of why things could be managed much more efficiently. But again, with, with larger order numbers and context, you can look at things like, again, these, these types of chronic illnesses. You know, another one is obviously cancer. I believe a lot of people have known somebody or have had somebody close to them that have dealt with cancer as a disease. You know, these, these types of illnesses do kill a lot of people on a yearly basis. And these are numbers that are tracked and uh, definitely quantified in a larger order statistical type of sense. And if, if they were really taken into account to show like, hey, what, are, what can we do to really try and mitigate these things as opposed to just the FDA releasing some guidelines of what they think is the best way to, to manage heart disease or how to try and prevent cancer this way. It's very much not looking at what is actually causing these issues, which is the, the system itself and people having no access to medical resources, good quality food, and education when it comes to lifestyle choices that that might help mitigate these things yeah yeah like how it's all it's all very tied together it might sound kind of like long term but it, when all of these things are working at the same time like they do i mean there's so many areas that could be improved somehow yeah these are preventable illnesses to to some degree and it's just a matter of, of how much the system is designed to really take these things into account. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, basically isn't, again, like a harken way back to one of our earlier episodes about externalities, but yeah, public health is practically treated like an externality. Exactly. You know, like a symptom of the system. And it, it really is. And you can see that the symptoms are raging and it's something that's not just not being taken as an example of of something that can be changed. It's almost looked at as like, oh, it's just some inevitable reality that as the population grows, more and more people are going to die of of these you know types of chronic diseases. When in reality, it should be like, oh, 
what are the underlying structural mechanisms that are producing these things? Because, yeah, you could look at it from a purely medical standpoint, but it's it's what got people to that situation in the first place that is really the root cause of, of why this is an important thing to look at. Yes. Yeah, it's societal change, not just, you know, like how you said earlier, a Band-Aid on a, on a gushing wound. You need, like, a from the, the bottom up a societal change. Yep, and it's definitely a metric to look at. Uh, probably the most important point here that we're going to touch on, uh, besides the one that we're going to talk about at the end of the episode here coming up, but talking about outright and structural violence. That is very important, and structural violence is a bit of an abstract concept, but it's something that's very important to mention as another large indicator of, of public health situations, not only locally in your community or in a country level, but also globally around the system. So we all know what outright violence is. Somebody puts a gun to your head, pulls the trigger. Somebody committed that act of violence. It's something that you can trace to an individual who has perpetrated a certain act. That's That's very well known. But structural yeah. violence is deaths that result from system mechanisms and system influences. So you can't point at one individual and say, he's the one who's responsible for all these people in Ohio getting cancer or all these people in a certain third world country that are dying of, of preventable diarrheal diseases or, or things like that. It's very much a consequence of the system itself and you can look again at uh we've mentioned him before dr james gilligan of uh, harvard and he very much talks about structural violence as he's he's done studies on it but i think there's estimated to be around 18 million people globally that die every year from structural violence so again these are of preventable means that are as a result of system consequences. So again, these are diseases that we have easily treatable uh, medicinal regimens for, as I mentioned, diarrheal diseases, malaria, things of that nature that could just be quite easily solved with some type of uh, regimen or lack of food, lack of water, uh, some sort of situation with the culture or the government where you might have like a civil war some kind of violence coming about from that or it could be people who have been affected by malfeasance when it comes to a corporation you know as i said example is like the the 3m corporation there was a point i think in like the 70s i believe where 3m was like headquartered in in ohio and they were dumping uh, essentially toxic chemicals and stuff into the Ohio River Valley. And a lot of the farmers and communities that resided along those waterways started not only seeing their, their cattle die and stuff from drinking the water, but eventually it worked its way into the households and people. And you saw large spikes in, in cancer rates in these communities. And it had been traced back to the mm -hmm. chemicals that were being released in, in the water as a result of pollution mechanisms so again it's it's not something that you can point at to some individual but it is a system consequence of uh of the socioeconomic uh, order structural violence like is definitely a big one because it just kills such a large number of people globally but what what comes to your mind when you think of a term like that chris no oh, that's what i was just about to say water is what i was kind of thinking of like it's insane to me that the fact that there are still people dying of thirst is kind of an issue when you know we're yeah. so used to just having running water like on the sides of our house inside of our house in multiple places you can drink any of it and you'll be fine but like just because of where other people live and kind of like the history that they've had to go through because of their area that seems like a reason that it, that that problem has been fixed, but now we like fuck we have the technology to to be able to provide water to pretty much everyone in the world. You know we have the ways and means to do that, but it's not done, and that's like pretty crazy to me. Like how could 
how could you not get the water to these people yet? You know, uh, yeah. Then like, then what's not a direct thing? You can't just point to any one person because there's a ton of reasons that you know places like these have these issues. But still, at this day and age, um, the fact that it hasn't been something looked at and like solved is is fucking crazy. Yeah, and you can see that they. We, we see what the consequences are. We see the deaths. It's something we can tally and toll and track, but it's it's not looking deeper than just, oh, these are poor countries. They need to get themselves together. You know, that's easy to say, and it's very much a route that somebody who hasn't, like, dove too deep into the larger order system might really come to you know, yeah, it sucks that these people don't have a functioning government or good public infrastructure, and they've very much been, been torn down in that aspect, but whatever, it's a system consequence. Well, yeah, and it's something that could easily be fixed through proper resource allocation. I mean, again, as Chris said, we have the technical capacity to easily solve issues like this and to just see it come back to some monetary issue again when it comes to resource allocation is just crazy to consider so that's that's kind of a uh, touching on the subject of structural violence again it's something that is brought about as a consequence of of what the system and the structure as a whole produces not outright violence but it's definitely something that can be tracked and is another important metric when it comes to talking about public health. Uh, the next or the last point here is just going to be touching on something briefly that we've mentioned before, which is social capital, which is something else that can be tracked as a public health metric. It's essentially the amount of trust that somebody might have in a random individual that they would meet on the street or come across in their in their daily doings that they like don't know. Uh, this is something that could be tracked through questionnaires and talking to people on the streets and more of the sociological type of work behind the scenes. And if a society has high levels of social capital, you're going to see that play out in different facets of the society. So you could even tie it into like the prison system. You know, if you come from a highly stratified, competitive and violent society, you're obviously going to see a correlation with how much social capital exists between individuals. Whereas on the other side of the spectrum, you're going to see that be much higher, the social capital in a system that is not as violent, has a more rehabilitative prison system, and is just overall treating more people with, with levels of equality, and there's not as much friction between your average individuals. So social capital... As I said, I believe we talked about it in episode uh, three, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, it's definitely something that can also be tracked in as a metric. And there's there's probably other things that we're not mentioning here in this podcast episode. Again, you can look towards public health researchers for other metrics that would be important. But uh, we're going to get into the last point here, which is the most important one. And it is looking at how you take public health and have it be a system feedback. Something that me and Chris are very much proponents of here and in what we talk about on this podcast is shifting towards a system that is more viable. And in order to create a viable system, you need to have feedback mechanisms that help regulate the system. So... Mm -hmm. Public health, how do you see that fitting into the picture, Chris? It's like um, it would almost be the final stage of of all of, of the outputs and the effects that they're having in society and then and then what those are causing amongst the people because remember the people are the 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 fifth layer, right? They're the um, yep. the ultimate feedback in the feedback loop. And what's happening to them, everything underneath public health. You know what's a what violence are they going through? What levels of the social capital do they have? Um, with the food quality, everything we just talked about, and more. Like all of these things 
will you know it's a it's a, a umbrella term public health for for what the system is actually causing to the people to happen so that's what you should look at for how you're going to adjust the system you take the information that the people are giving you through all of these things that are affecting us and uh and you know we're, data we could actually find and search and, and it's recorded and use that as a, a beginning guide point at the beginning of the system go back to the beginning and see what changes need to be made to start adjusting all of these 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 uh, outputs of the system here and you could look at you know again we could go back to the heart disease example if you see an uptick in a community when it comes to to heart disease having that information as a system feedback you'd say okay maybe we need more medical treatment or diagnostic equipment or we might have an issue with with food quality access and you can take that information and make a informed system adjustment to help try and mitigate these aspects as opposed to just up oh, well the numbers are climbing and climbing it is what it is um it's mm. it's very valuable information that shows that there is some kind of an issue occurring and what can be done with that information in terms of how the system functions to help mitigate those outcomes because uh, it's about creating a system that allows people to live the healthiest lives as possible with access to what they need to survive and having that be a metric and a mechanism that feeds in you know even talking about the the new humans right the new human rights movement episode we did it could be a metric of the digitized network feedback it could be something that people can input into the system and say that you know they could discuss the medical issues they're having and have it be sort of a you know another way to feedback into the system so it it's very important to look at public health in this sort of lens when it comes to talking about a socioeconomic shift it is just invaluable data and an invaluable tool to use as a way to help design a better system as opposed to mm -hmm. just something that is thrown in the bin thrown in the wayside as just another statistic that we track just to see what's going on in reality when again it's information that we could very much use to help better the system yeah yeah you actually need to take the info in mm. and very much uh use it to the best of the system's capabilities but that, I mean, that's that's really as far as I can think when it comes to us talking about public health. Again, I very much ask everybody here to go and, and look up public health researchers and to see what kind of other metrics when it comes to the topic of public health to reference here. Again, somebody like Dr. James Gilligan very much incentivized people to go out and just explore his work, see what, what he's done and different aspects of the study of public health. But yeah, no, it's it's definitely something that's important and we need to look towards uh, really having it be a bigger system shift to, again, create a more viable system. So that's the goal. <clears throat> that is the goal. Uh, so is there anything else you want to touch upon, Chris, before you head and head out? Not necessarily regarding all of these points. I mean, I did like how you mentioned the, uh, in the last episode the the new rights movement and the points that we made. You remember um, localization and access as well? Absolutely. Yeah, those, I uh, was thinking about how strong they would tie into things like our food quality and uh, the concept of these food deserts and then, you know, access to being able to change that and localization being able to change that. Like, you start to see how all these things tie in together in, in the viable system they're trying to to explain here. Yeah, I think it's very much a, a bigger picture that we're trying to paint. So it's it's very much an ongoing discussion that we're gonna continue having here. And yeah, no, very very good point to to really belie here, but I think looking at it as a way that we can really 
it's just, as I said, invaluable data that we can use to help really, really better the situation and make the system more viable. So, yeah, sir. All right. Well, that is going to end today's episode, everybody. Make sure to tune in uh, in the next uh, two weeks or so when we release the next episode. Again, talking about food, water, and energy potentials. It is sure to be a banger. But all right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and head out. Have a good one. Mm -hmm.